Uh, yeah. Um, hello, my name is Pablo Stasmike. Today I will tell you a little bit about my journeys with keyboards and why I think they are broken by design. Um, I think there are not too much here who do not understand English. I uh, do not understand German, uh, but anyway I want to hold this talk in English because Linux Tage likes to um, add uh, content with English and I think uh, people will watch the, the uh, video and then we have a bigger audience and I think that's good. Okay, so, um, broken up by design. Um, let's have a quiz. First, how do you use your keyboards? First principle, eagle, yeah, eagle's flying, finding his target, yeah, and it's, uh, maybe you use the 10 finger system, so, or the 8 and a half finger system, something like this. You learn it at one time in school and yeah, you're a little bit uh, using it. Or are you a touch typist with, um, like, I could write a protocol in the dark with distraction and chocolate, whatever. So, who is the type of eagle typer here? Yeah? It's no shame, it's just a proper use of keyboard. <laughs> um, who is the eight and a half finger typist? Okay, that's the majority. Um, who thinks he or she can type in the dark and get a perfect text? Yeah? Okay, one extra question. Who thinks he or she can hit reliably the function keys in the dark? <laughs> No, right, come on. It's so easy. There's just uh, one additional row in the group before. No? Okay, I think we already found one flow at least. Next question would be here What is your keyboard? Do you care about special keyboards or you, do you just take the default keyboard that came with your computer? Uh, next question or next category would be Are you using a laptop? Because the laptop keyboards are different, always. Yeah. Um, are you using a mechanical keyboard because you care about your fingers and you like the sound and have something like um, high quality? Or are you a gamer? Yeah, gamers have incredible fancy keyboards. Or do you have any other fancy stuff like all this alternative keyboards. So, who is the default keyboard writer? You could also um, uh, raise your hand for multiple options. So, yeah, maybe at work, things, things like that. Yeah. Who uses a laptop? Wow! Okay. Uh, mechanical keyboards? Ah, uh -huh. okay. Then a little bit more expensive, isn't it? Uh, gamers? So I looked at the game by keyboards, you can have them with all the different kind of background colors and, yeah, and, and colors for your favorite key, for your favorite thing, whatever. Um, and fancy or special purpose keyboards. Yeah. Perfect. So we already have here a nice variety of, of different uses. Um, let's see. I think that the keyboard is a very high performance interface. I think it's the fastest and most reliable interface that we have. So you could not write with a mouse. Writing on your phone is always a little bit slow and blah, not working as well. In fact, I, my estimation is that you can have hundreds of keystrokes per minute. So my usual good writing speed is 180 uh, keystrokes per minute which I think is quite okay, but there are faster ones. Um, best writers have more than 600 strokes per minute. That's 10 strokes per second. Yeah? And with roughly 6 bits per key, maybe like alphabet, shift, numbers a little bit like that, you then get yeah, thousands of bits per minute into your computer, which is quite okay, I think. So we should care about our primer primary user interface to compute. Of course, nowadays you use your mouse as well, or maybe a touchpad, or you use your pocket computer with a finger. 
But this is our high performance uh, interface, and um, a lot of people work with that at uh, work, and uh, they need to to um, yeah take care of the fingers maybe the hands. It's it's a crucial crucial part of work in, in, um, in work, and you may even type faster than you can speak. Sometimes it's easy to speak faster than you think, so it's, you can even write faster than you can think. Uh, so, um, you might think this important type of interface is highly optimized, right? So, who of you thinks there is a good reason why keyboards are like they are? Like someone had a, <coughs> made a design and now we have something clever, yeah? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Who thinks it was not it was just an accident, <laughs> or it happened while making it? Yeah. Okay. Dif different points of view. Very good. So are you still with me? Very good. Um, we have a lot of history and legacy with the keyboards. So actually, what we need today have as a keyboard started as typewriters, maybe 150 years ago, and at that, that at that time. People were very happy to have something to write uh, mechanically, so they, they did not care too much about things that are important now. For them, it was important to have something that works reliably and has all the keys on it. You know, different designs, and in the end, something like we have here with the keyboards today survived. And it was a mechanical design, so the constraints were for a mechanical system, not for a micro mechanical system or electronic system like we have it today. And when computers were introduced, the microcomputers maybe in the 80s, also in the 70s already, there were peculiar designs, for example, for the Lisp machine. Who of you ever have seen a, a big picture of the keyboard of the Lisp machine? It's like this big and it has extra keys like meta, super, hyper, uh, and fancy stuff like uh, exists and for all and all strange symbols. In the end, um, the traditional keyboard from or the traditional layout from the, from the typewriter was, was adopted. And there were different models, um, Unix models with extra keys and things uh, in the range. But in the end, we had a unification in the 80s. And the last change was probably the last introduced feature was the Windows key with Windows 95, which is a redesign or reuse of maybe something that existed before. But this is what you get now when you buy, buy a keyboard in, in a shop. So you have to go there and you find something that looks like yeah, this here. Yeah? And you will recognize it immediately and no surprises. <coughs> Now let's see here what are some of the, uh, of the interesting and maybe strange peculiar uh, parts. We have your standard uh, an US American layout. I got this from a nice uh, website, keyboardlayouteditor.com. You can make there your own keyboard layouts. And I used it uh, throughout the uh, year. And it's an American layout, English layout with a Y here on top. So this is called the QWERTY. Uh, British? Yeah. yeah. Entity. Entity. Yes, there's an ISO version and there's the 105 and 104 key version. I, I choose with the ISO version. Okay. Um, what do I find interesting here is that we have shifted rows. So, look at that here. We have here again, and we have here again, and here we all also have. Here. Yeah. So, what could that be good for? Maybe for the right hand to fit the fingers better because you turn your hand a little bit and then it works quite well. Yeah. Think like that. Yeah. Who, who would, would say this was a thing by design? Yeah. Okay, so what about the left hand? Well, the left hand is highly unoptimized or disoptimized. 
actually, this is legacy from the, from the mechanical keyboard. The mechanical typewriters had to have their keys shifted, otherwise the mechanics would not be possible to arrange properly. And that was, was adopted for, um, for computer key uh, keyboards, for reasons of like, so that people who already can, already can type write uh, touch type uh, don't have to adopt very much. And since then, this is done. And my experience is, if you so show someone a keyboard which has not this shifted rows, they are highly disturbed. Really. Yeah? I have here something like this. This is the left half of the keyboard. Doesn't look like a keyboard, does it? Yeah. In my mapping, here's the shift key. I split the, the, the long keys to make it a little more easy to design. And I have here a tab key. I have escape even here. And here are the numbers and everything. No space bar. Yeah. But the only reason for this is really legacy. There is no um, um, ergonomic reason, or it's not optimized for, for usage. It's optimized for mechanics. So that's the one, the one thing. Next thing, we have caps lock. Who of you uses caps lock at work? Yeah, really? For emails. For emails, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, you like to shout, yeah? Okay. Other good reasons? So, when you had a, a typewriter, at that time there was no bold or underline. There was some type of underline, but you had to do it yourself. And if you wanted to have a headline in caps, you had to press the caps or the, the shift key, and this would move the mechanical the roll at, uh, at the, the paper, and this would lift it up. You would have to press it with your pin key. Yeah, very heavy work, don't want to do that all the time, holding it down for the whole row. So you lock it, you write, and you press it again, it's unlocked. Nowadays, not, not much use. Yeah, you could do this easily with your finger, it doesn't, it doesn't work very much. So I would say caps lock is clearly legs. Then navigation block on the right side, right side, and the, the uh, 10 keys here. So this would be the navigation block, and And the so-called 10 keys are, are this block here, the number keys. So but whenever you find a 10 keyless keyboard, it's one without this. Uh, these were introduced, yeah, okay, uh, navigation is quite nice. But in fact, all the keys you have here in this, in this navigation block are always in, uh, also in this, in this uh, 10 key block. Whenever you do not press an unlock, you have all this stuff. And then things get strange. So this is just redundancy. And at one point it was decided like, yeah, we want to have it both ways. And people are used to the one, people are used to the other. Just put it on the keyboard. 20 more keys, nothing. No I think it's purpose to have two people play the same That would be probably the reason for, for the manufacturers to have it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it is a very, very uh, good interface, especially the ten keys for entering numbers. So this is something I really like, and of course, also the arrow keys have the good reason to uh, to be arranged like that. But it's kind of double. More legacy. With the German layout, so I have to I have to address that a little bit because there are some very very interesting facts here. We have that LGR key here, yeah. and it's not Alt Griechisch like in the last time. <laughs> <laughs> it is Ultimate Graphics, and when the German keyboard was introduced on the personal computer. They saw that there were some letters in German that are not represented in the English layout, so they thought about what should we do, should we produce new keywords? No, very easy. We just change the mapping and we take the right alt key and we make a special function out of it. And if you press the right alt key, you can use all this extra 
Um, assignments here, you have the curly braces and uh, the brackets and whatnot. And that's a good um, solution. Of course, it's not a good solution. Everyone who programs C knows uh, the pain when pressing the Alt GR key with the thumb because it's on the same side. It's a modifier, and you have to press it on the same side as you, as a key you want to press with it. So this destroys all the, the navigation of your fingers on the on the keyboard. And you lose your Alt key, and in fact, it is coded as a, a, a Control and Alt together, so you cannot press. Alt, uh, you cannot press um, bracket and control together. It will not decode. And some programs really suffer that. So, mm, not so good. What about the size of the keys? <coughs> so, the key sizes are 90 millimeters per square, which is some number in the, in the imperial, uh, imperial units. Uh, I saw keyboards, I think I have one with me, that are much much smaller. And now with numbers here on top, it's no problem suddenly anymore. And on laptops you also have different key sizes. And on my EPC 701, the very small one, it's a little bit different, but it's very good to work with. So the standard size is also maybe some kind of legacy you could get that smaller or maybe smaller caps. And also the number of rows, uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. And of course the layout. So, who had the great idea to put one of the least important keys in German, like this O, <laughs> yeah, on the on the home row on your right? You never use it. Easy way to find out which keys you use is you just try to find the reflections. And you can find something for your thumb where you use the, the um, space key or an enter and. Try to find a spot on the bird. So there are some bad decisions here, and in fact the layout was not designed for our ergonomy, but for not letting the levels of the mechanical typewriter crash and tangle with each other. So it was kind of um, artificial slowdown to, to <laughs> let the mechanical keyboard work for the problem. Okay, so I had some inspirations in the last few years, what could be improved? And one easy way is to change the layout. And for the first try, you could try to optimize to hit the, the you to, to, to move the, um, the letters or the keys that you use most often to the place where it's most easy to get. So you put them on the home row, and here you have first the, the, the walls. And then you have S, N, R, T, and D, which are the most um, the highest frequency letters in German. For English, this would be a little bit different. And here it's also a little bit biased by some design to have the umlaut letters arranged to match the, the original letters a little bit. And also something like X, D, and C you want to have together. Okay, I see I have entered three times the same picture, which is bad because the new layout, I have to correct it afterwards for the, for the, for the saved uh, presentation. The new layout has a very nice trait. You have more than one layer, you have two, three, four, five, six layers. And on the third layer, you have all the, the um, special keys like braces and uh, like uh, plus, minus, and whatever. All the, the nice things you want to have in programming or not writing uh, text. That's really nice. One inspiration. The next is Ergodox. Who, who of you has heard of Ergodox? Yeah? Two, four, five, seven, eight, maybe? Yeah? So this emerged a few years ago and has a, quite a good followership. And you can build them yourself, and sometimes there are who buys to, to build them. And this is now first a split design, and one idea was here to use the, the, the thumb. So for your pinky, for your right pinky, you have 15 keys to use. Yeah. Here on this layout, you have all these keys here for the pinky. It's 15, 
15 keys. For your thumb, you have two thumbs for one key. So half a uh, key for your thumb. I think we can shift this a little bit, yeah? Um, and I think you can use your thumb much better as a modifier because your range of movement with the thumb pressed down is bigger than the range of movement with the pinky pressed down. And it's, it's more, it's more movement. So Ergodox was really, really interesting and you can buy the sets to build this and you have to, to buy all the parts and then you can solve it yourself or you can even buy it. And also a very interesting thing that for me is like thinking out of the box is the key mouse. So whenever you have to switch between your keyboard and your mouse, you lose time, you lose concentration, you have to reorientate. You can use the left hand with the mouse, maybe now press enter with the thumb when you use the mouse, and things like that. But why not integrate both into one device? I think that's a good idea. I um, think it costs 500 euros or dollars and it's not yet in production. I want to see one. I want to try that. I think it's, it's, really, it's really an interesting experience. Okay, so maybe we can, we can find something that is really a little bit better. Um, a rich source of information uh, for me was the Test Authority community. This is a website with a forum and a wiki. And they really document a lot of different designs and uh, discuss a lot of interesting things. Not only keyboards, but also mice and other input uh, devices. Very interesting. I found keyboards which have only eight keys and can be handled with one hand, things like that. Demographic for keyboards, all kind of fancy stuff. A lot of different ideas I really like. And you also get good ideas and resources how to buy parts. Okay. So, talking about ergonomy, I think we have a few things to think of. First, there is the hand, and we want to think about how the hand is used with the keyboard. There's the tilt, and uh, whenever you have a mechanical keyboard, you have them here in the back, um, the standards, and you can change um, the tilt angle. That's actually a requirement from uh, working in um, what's called um, Arbeitssicherheit, yeah. um, working environment for production. And you have to be able to change it, but it never says which ang angles you have to use. Mechanical keyboards was very steep, and people were used to, to write on them with flying hands, not, not everywhere, uh, not anywhere uh, having support for your elbows or something like that. And if you would write it with your hands, laid down on the table, this was an awkward position and here you have, uh, um, you get problems here in the Kapal tunnel and that can be very, um, um, very un, un, um, how is it? Uh, um, painful. Okay, then there's the angle for your uh, joint here. So your natural position would not be to have your hands parallel or the fingers parallel but to have them in a, in a certain angle. You cannot, you cannot put your hands like that in front and front. The rotation of the hand is also uh, not optimal, so your rotation this way is kind of limited. This way you can turn it a little bit more, so your natural position will be a little bit uh, rotated upwards. And then there's this the, the question about the elbow position. Should you lie your elbow down to, um, to ease your, your shoulders of the, of the weight or not? Do you want to move with the elbows? Can you move your hands while writing on it? Fingers, I think the pinky is heavily overloaded, especially the right one, the left one as well. A lot of things to do with it, modifiers, pressing two, three, three keys, escape, tap, whatever. The thumb is underloaded. Um, the thumb is, uh, is also underloaded uh, in terms of versatility. And the range of fingers has to be taken into account. You can't stretch your fingers only so far. And if you have to press the F keys, usually you have to lift your hand off and get more um, movability. Then you have movement in the shoulder. This strains your shoulder, probably not. not, not. Reorientation is a, is a topic which was a start for me because I found out that in writing uh, and changing the fields on the keyboard where I was working, 
I was always looking down for just a, a fraction of a, of a second to find the position again. So really not looking and finding your 10 key block and your error block and your mouse and going back takes time and um, um, also takes concentration. And yeah, the position of the modifiers, why can't we use them? Okay. Uh, why can't we? Well, they are important, we agree on that. So things like enter are important, we use them a lot. Backspace is important, escape maybe is important, tap is important. So why are they so big? Yeah, because they're important and they are at the bad place. So maybe we could, we, we could shift the position of the key a little bit closer to where we access them easily and we can make them smaller and have them more accessible. What I think is not ergonomy is just splitting a keyboard and making some marketing. I have some, something like that at home and I like it, but it's not improving the situation very much. Um, if you ask a physiotherapist if this is something improving your uh, situation of the shoulder, I'm quite sure you would say that. So this is just, yeah, looks looks peculiar, maybe strange to you, maybe you can make money out of it, uh, but I don't think it really improves something for a lot. Okay. So if you want to improve that, you could build your own and you can try out all your ideas yourself. And for me the biggest step was thinking outside of the box. Like not accepting what is here, just thinking like what would I do if I would have to create a key-based interface from scratch. Okay, two hands, ten fingers, limited range of fingers. Maybe we can start with something like that, but what are the things that really wouldn't be made like this? Uh, so if, if, if there was a Kickstarter campaign for, for a new interface uh, device, and this was the keyboard, I'm quite sure there would be a lot of bad commands about like uh, keys being on the wrong position and different sizes and shifted rows. And uh, If you want to build one yourself, you have to get maybe 10 different sizes of keys because of the shift of the very So when you build your one yourself, you can get a few of the ingredients and you can try it yourself. And of course you need some key switches. I have a few of them uh, with me. So you can have a look at them. You just buy them. That's my, uh, clicky stuff here and they have contacts and you have to wire them but then you are not finished you need key tabs that's the part here on top of the keys and of course on your keyboard you can also pull off the key tabs but usually they are different sizes and different angles and different rows so you cannot change them uh, by random which really makes it difficult to try out uh, other layers so I got key caps which are neutral in size and shape they are very hard to source so key caps cost like 50 cent per part and um, you get your own run if you if you order them starting with 500 uh, or 500 not parts but then you have to ship them and they speak for them to come so this is the thing you would order first um, then you need some wiring, and I could go into details, I don't want to do that, you can read this up yourself. Uh, you have to wire some kind of matrix, because you don't have enough inputs at any electronic interface to have one switch for E or one line for, for each key. So you make a matrix and you need diodes to not have pressing three buttons or three switches at the same time also um, uh, shortcut the connection for the port. For the yeah, then you need a microcontroller and you want one uh, which can do USB natively. 
So you can then program it to pre pretend to be a keyboard, and that's just a regular USB keyboard, no drivers required, and it will work right away. Uh, you can even program it to act as a like a mouse, or maybe volume control or sound device, whatever. It's up to you. You can you can choose, but usually you want to do that. Um, of course, you need a little bit of software. There are a few packages and a few, few uh, systems uh, out there in the wild. Of course, you can get them at GitHub. I choose TMT um, because it's it's very very easy to stack on, on uh, multiple layers. And of course, you have to think of the layout because in the end. That's also part of what we want to change, and then you can you can hack right away, and you have to think about how to arrange that together. So there are keyboard builders who are very fond of reproducing something they have at home already. So they buy all the special keys in different rows, and they create exactly the same layout again. I don't think that is very interesting, at least not for me, because I can buy that in a shop anyway, and in the end it's expensive and I do it just once and then the fun is over. So I mm, I just want to do that uh, multiple times. It costs us about 100 euros, so you have to buy the key switches, which are like 50 cents per piece or maybe 1 euro per piece. You have to buy the keycaps, microcontrollers, maybe about 20 euros. And then the rest of the stuff, and you end up maybe at 100 euros. Um, spending 100 euros for a prototype for me is too expensive. I cannot afford it for a very long time. And, um, spending too much money takes the fun out of it. So I thought of how to easily be able to try out different layouts um, without consuming too much of my precious key switches and uh, without making too much PCP layouts all the time. Making PCP layouts is really a lot of work and maybe you're not interested in PCP layouts, you're interested in keyboard anyway. And producing your PCBs is also expensive, it takes time. So I want to modelize this and what I did is, there's a very nice property about this Cherry MX, these are quite popular. There is a German company producing these key modules for now decades. They are really popular and they are very high uh, quality and very uh, reliable. And you can put them on a, on a PCB, on a, on a platine. Or you can drop them in a frame and they have clips here. And this, then they are stuck in the frame, you can clip them out again. And that's what I did here. I just made out of plywood, I lasered out my layout, it was easy, it took 50 minutes, and then I can clip in my keys and my keycaps, and then done. And the nice thing about this is I can, I can pull out the keys again, and that's now the, the tricky part about it, or the, 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 the trick about it. If I would have this all wired together, uh, it's stuck with it in my frame. And that's, that's the one thing that really uh, limits my, my design. And the rest I can wire anyway how I like it to be. So I wire each key singular. I have connectors here at the end. And then I can switch them on a board that I, I made myself. I can go it afterwards. And then I connect it to my microcontroller and now. Want to see? <laughs> okay. So this is my box for the A lot of nice stuff. So this is my prototype. Yeah, it looks really like a prototype, does it? And the trick is somewhere you have to cross out the lines of the matrix. So that's the hardest part. It's the only part that's really interesting in all of this. So I soldered here in the back, I soldered the lines to cross. So there are, there are a couple lines here on, on the keyboard running in, uh, along with the board. And then I have to cross it somewhere for the lines and for the rows to cross. So that's quite true. Then I just wanted to get started. That's what I got. And 
I'm already in an iteration for version 2, which is much cleaner and much easier to use. But it works. So I have here my breadboard, and I connect all the lines to the pins on the microcontroller, and the rest is software. I just have to, get, I have to make sure that all the switches are connected to the right connections here. That's all I have to do for the hardware. Okay. We can try this out later, it's working, and um, you will see it's not much work. Yeah, that's how this looks like. This is my laser uh, board here. Uh, this is the key soldered um, to a single line, and here I can plug in my my button to the to the And this is my basic layout. I tried out shifting the rows a little bit. I think that's yeah, in the hand view it's was not that good, uh, that's what you made the prototype for, you learn out of it. And then on the left and on the right you have some left over, and on the bottom the blue buttons are for the thumbs. So the first, first thing I tried was putting enter and backspace on thumb keys to not use the pink anymore. Yeah? <laughs> okay, then I felt like, yeah, you could do more. And I ended up with this. <laughs> and I want to go further, so I want to really optimize it, but I myself have to make some transition. So I want to stay with what I learned the, left, uh, the, the last 30 years, maybe. And uh, so my brain has needs some time to adopt. I tried to match everything that I can find on a, a metro on a normal keyboard, keyboard here again. You have backspace here. You have escape on the left side, and I think that's for the wing people. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, just to keep them in put. Uh, on the bottom here is um, backspace on the left thumb and delete, so it's forward and backward deletion. And on the right thumb, I have here enter and space and the modifier key. Um, you see that the, the um, uh, letters are quite traditional. So I start here A, S, E, F, G, H, J, K, L. And when I switch, for example, to the right upper part here, I have already the numbers also included here. So I have also legacy here. Uh, but I think this is a good interface. I think you can, you can use it quite good. And on the left, I have left arrow, right arrow, down, up. But also page down, page up. Um, that's the end and the position one button. The F buttons are always are also uh, mapped to the to the numbers here, and so this matches together. And I get the F key, the function keys. Uh, to a reachable position, and so on. One more thing here are M label things. This is mouse movement. So I could find, find, adjust the mouse position with a keyboard. Maybe that's interesting. Or I have a, a left mouse click somewhere here. So I can use the mouse with my right hand and have a click on the left hand, which releases my right hand from doing two things at the same time. High precision position and also clicking. Clicking always moves your mouse a little bit. So let's adjust the first ideas. And maybe I can get rid of the caps lock and move the control key up and all things like that. Okay, there are a lot of things that I could tell you more about that. I could talk half a day about it. So what, what it would be interesting how the USB protocol came into being and what is peculiar about this because this is kind of emulating the IBM protocol which is then also inside the computer um, translated to a different protocol and USB tries to fit that and extend it and strange things happening. 
um, keyboard mappings, layout mappings, um, building your own case is a big, big topic. In the end, you want to have it nice. Maybe you want to have it transparent to show off a little bit that you have your own solar uh, electronics inside. Maybe you want to make it out of brushed aluminium or wood or whatever. You can spend a lot of time with that. Lights, yeah, for the gamers, lights. Yeah. Fancy lights? No lights? Okay, no lights. Um, tactile feedback. We have it. We have it uh, on, on the, the phone. Tactile feedback. We have the, the um, vibration. Acoustic feedback. Maybe it's interesting to have an artificial click with your keys. No? Or maybe you have, want to have nice, sound, soft sounds. <laughs> yeah, you can do this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you can you can uh, plug in your headphones and then. Uh, maybe you want to output the keys in Morse code in Unicode, or you want to input it. Yeah, just a binary interface. Why not? You can integrate the display and show what the, the state of the, of the device is. Macros, like enter your password somewhere in the keyboard, and you don't just have to press the secret macro. No. Okay. <laughs> Compose the key, if you know that, to make the fancy stuff flow. So, if nothing is left over for you, maybe you just think about it, and maybe this just extends your, your box that you expect and that you think, think of. And, uh, maybe in five years, in ten years, I think you'll be different keyboard designs and people accept them. I hope so. Uh, maybe you build one. So if you are interested, please talk to me. Uh, I can show you all my designs and my files. I will uh, also uh, put in links in the, in the material of the talk. And I would be very glad to hear about other opinions and, and uh, ideas. Okay. Any more questions? Yep. What do you think about the additional mouse interface that is not uh, is this a touchpad or the, the knob? The knob, yeah. I personally don't like it, but everything that presents a different way is probably a plus for someone. So if you have just a touchpad and the knob, I also have a knob here on my laptop, I don't use it, but I don't think it's, it's quite fine. If you like it, take it. Yeah? Is it hard to learn to move over there, or is it hard to switch back to the knob? Uh, I can write with English layout and with German layout and it's just like missing two types and then you switch over. It's like switching to a different language. Of course you have to learn it and it takes time. You can use a, a typing um, touch type learning program. Yes, it is it in a sense. But already you learn something and you learn it again. Yes. Uh, just two comments. Uh, I do a lot more editing than I do yeah. typing in large yeah. text. So I think the key mouse approach seems quite good. Yeah. Uh, okay. I yeah. just looked it up. You can now buy a pizza set. Okay. Uh, for 298 and assembly for sale. Oh! The, and you can use 3D grids and plastic. Okay. So they outsourced it to the yeah. casing. Yeah. You can get printer and casing, which you can buy the floor. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Point. Second comment, um, there are these totally programmable keyboards where you they have like built-in LEDs. Yes. So there are things layout which can at least switch around which keys you have there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you don't have to solve or anything. Yeah, there are a lot of different things out in the wild and you can uh, with, with more expensive models you can you can uh, change it yourself the layout and you can do a lot of customization. Uh, but you have to then find out yourself of course what you do. Um, okay. One more minute. Any more questions? Yeah. What do you think about the, the five five key keyboards or stuff like that? Five? Yeah, where you have one key per finger and just enter combinations. Okay. You do then binary uh, entering this, or you this you code your uh, um, inside. I think it is not the natural way to move your fingers. My personal opinion, and it's not speeding you up. So you have to press them, you have to release them. With uh, separate keys, you can always switch from one key to the other. 
And one more thing that I think is most important, I have a keyboard which is unlabeled. I like that. But I think in the end, you want to have a keyboard which is labeled, which everyone can use even with the legal system, because you just press what you read and it's done. <laughs> that would be the, the I think one of the most important things. The end. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I can show you a little bit uh, afterwards outside and thank you for attention.